My dear family and friends, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may his grace and his mercy and his peace be with you. May it dwell with you each and every day. Today, as we dig into Proverbs a bit further, we again see the wisdom of God intended for us, not only for people 2,000 years ago or more, but for us today as well. Wisdom that speaks to our lives, wisdom that speaks to the way that we are to be as sisters and brothers gathered in this place. As we prepare to hear God's word for us, please bow your heads with me at this time. Gracious Lord, we thank you. We thank you for giving us the wisdom as recorded in the book of Proverbs. Wisdom that teaches us how to live according to your wills and your desires. Lord, we pray that you would lead us always by your holy word. That you would lead us to have hearts open to what you would teach us. Lord, forgive us for those times when our hearts are hardened, when our backs are turned. Help us always remember the gift of grace that we have through your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. In 1939, moviegoers were treated for the first time in history to the greatest cinematic experience, as some would describe it, that is known to Technicolor today, The Wizard of Oz. Sir, some of you knew that already. The Wizard of Oz, when MGM initially released it, it was actually, it, was, it had a poor reception. But then by 1941, people had gleaned on and were really taking hold of it. And now you go into living rooms around the country, probably around the world, and you can hear Dorothy Gale belting out her delightful death cans. You can hear the raucous words of the, of the lollipop guild as they welcome her to Munchkin Land, right? <laughs> We can hear the strong voice of the Wizard of Oz. We can hear the shrieks of those winged monkeys. And we can even hear the cackles of the Wicked Witch of the West. I suspect most of you in this room have heard and seen this wonderful cinematic movie of the Wizard of Oz. And, and so you know uh, how, how the story goes. As, as Dorothy Gale is searching for her, her way back home, she comes across three fellow travelers, three folks in need as well, who have various needs. The Scarecrow, of course, who needs his? Oh, I thought more of you had saw it than that. Yeah, it's his brain. He's, he's looking for a brain. And then we, she comes across the, the Tin Woodsman, and the tin, wo tin Woodsman needs a? Heart. Heart. And finally, she comes across the Cowardly Lion. This is a really easy one in case you haven't even seen it. And he wants courage. And so they join together on the beautiful yellow brick road, and they start singing, We're off to see the wizard. Now, Dorothy Gale, of course, is the main character, and, and so I'm sure many of you probably enjoy uh, looking upon Dorothy Gale, but, but for some reason, uh, I, I've always kind of been drawn to the Tin Woodsman. I don't know if it was his silver costume, you remember, it almost looked like a barrel, and then his, like, silver, uh, it wasn't the 80s, so it was on those, those uh, moon pants, but, but he kind of had that silver thing, and he, he just kind of had the axe, and, and, uh, and the, I was drawn to him as he was drawn to that desire for a heart. As he had that desire to have a heart, not in the sense of, of that important body part that, that is so important for each of us, isn't it? That, that you know if it's not beating, then that's a big problem. But in the sense of a heart to love and care for others, a heart to want to, to be there for others. And when you look at Scripture, a heart is such an important part of who we are. Not in the sense of love, but in the sense of a spiritual seat for us. Almost a thousand times throughout the pages of Scripture in different forms, the heart is discussed. And just think about it this morning. We heard about the heart in three different places just this morning. If we go further in Proverbs, we hear about how the heart is, is a spring that wells forth with, with goodness or, or the opposite. Or think about you know, sometimes when we, when we do the create in me from Psalm 51, we say create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Or, or think, think about Jesus in, in Mark chapter 7 or Luke chapter 6, which we just read. And, and he talks about how the heart, it's not what goes into a person that makes him or her unclean. It's, it's what comes out of the heart. The heart is this important spiritual center of the person. And if the heart is not set on God, then the life will not be set on God. If the heart is not set on God's word, then the life will not reflect the God's word. And so we get at some heart issues today, some heart problems today. In Proverbs chapter 6, 
Now, we might not like to use the word hate, and I, I don't blame you. It's, it's kind of an ugly word in many respects, isn't it? But notice that is the exact word that the author of Proverbs used. He used the word hate. And why? Because he was making it a very important point. He wanted people to know that this is significant. And he wanted them to hear and listen to why these six things the Lord hated. Now, we didn't hear the list that long ago, but I want to look back at that list because we're going to go through that list today. And we're going to talk about why the Lord hates those six things. But then finally, finally, why they caused the seventh, the abomination. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 6 at this time. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 6. It's, it's page 531, 531 in those reddish Bibles. Proverbs chapter 6, like I said a few weeks ago, if you just flip to Psalms, it's the next book of the Bible. And you know, almost if you just open the Bible, it'll uh, go to Psalms on its own sometimes. Unless someone marked a page, in which case it won't. But, but we'll go to Proverbs 6 right now. And I want to just kind of reflect on, on, on these things and, and why these things are things that the Lord hates. Now, before we read it, and I know you all are starting to look at it already, and that's great. Uh, notice, it, it doesn't say the Lord hates these people. It doesn't say that the Lord hates us for doing these things, but he hates these sins. All right, let's go to six, uh, and we'll go to verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. One who sows discord among brothers and sisters, this is the abomination. But all of these things as we go through, we will discover they lead to this problem of discord, this problem of dissension among God's people. The first one is one we, language we don't always use, although I suspect you all have a sense of what it means. Haughty eyes. Haughty eyes are discussing a prideful heart, a heart that's filled with, with judgmental eyes, eyes that look down on others because these eyes feel better than someone else. This heart is one that does not appreciate humility and all that God has done for him. And think about how that would be destructive to a relationship. Someone who's prideful, someone who is, is governed by a prideful heart and looks down on others. Are they going to be inclusive? Are they going to be loving and compassionate? But not only that, they're going to look upon God as though God is a God who, who is a convenience for them. As though God is a God who, who fills a need when they need Him, but otherwise, well, they have all that inside of them to be all that they can be. Then he keeps going after those haughty eyes. That pride, that center point. C.S. Lewis at one point in Mere Christianity says, well, really pride is the center point of so many other sins. But he keeps going and he says, a lying tongue. Well, again, how many people's reputations have been destroyed by lies? How many times in your own lives have lies, little white ones or big whopping ones, hurt you? The lies of others. How many times have your own lies cause problems between you and other people. Lies with your family members, lies with your co-workers, lies with fellow people in the congregation. Those lies catch up to us. And, they, and, and God is a God of truth. And so when our lives are full of lies, we are not speaking with the mouth of God, but with the Father of lies. And it's interesting, I don't know if it is to you all, but it is to me. Because twice, the author of Proverbs actually discusses lies. Did you notice that? I don't know if anybody else noticed it. But I had the advantage of looking at this in advance. In verse 19, he also picks up this concept of lying again. A false witness who breathes out lies. Now, now he's not just being redundant here. The author of Proverbs is not just, oh, wait, I forgot that one or something like that. Well, or I need a, a number six, so let me... But, but think about for a moment the problem with lies, but then also think about, as Luther says, not explaining things in the best possible way. Because I think that's what, what he's getting at there. Remember in the Eighth Commandment, it says, you shall not bear false witness. And as Luther's going through, and he's going through, and then he gets to the end of it, and he says, and explain everything in the best possible way. Now this is where I see, I think, in a lot of us, a lot of us, maybe not all of you, but, but, but a lot of us, that we don't explain things in the best possible way. We may not outright lie, but the way we tell the truth 
makes people look awful and sound awful. The way we describe an event makes people sound like the, or these events sound like the worst thing ever. And, and don't take my word for it. Think about it for just a moment. How often do you watch the news or listen to the news or even read the news on the internet? And the news might be true, but the way that it's presented is ugly. You don't have to answer that one aloud because I know the answer. And you can see how this one comes to play. It's, it's more than just telling the truth, but it's how you tell the truth as well. Lying and, 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 bearing, and bearing false witness are hand in hand because, because when you don't speak the be, in the best way, explain everything in the best possible way, as Luther said it, you're maligning a person, you're maligning an event, you're maligning an organization. And think about how that hurts the church. Think about how that hurts those who come together as the body of Christ. When we don't explain everything in the possible way, when we look at things and, and, and before we even find out what all is going on, we pass judgment. It, again, it creates that dissension, that division. Now the next one maybe, is, as, as we're going along, maybe you thought to yourself, well, this one's not bad. Well, that was for the people, you know, a couple thousand years ago. Actually, about 3,000 years ago, approximately. Hands that shed innocent blood. Good news, everyone. I don't think we have any murderers in the house. Please don't raise your hand, just in case. I do have to report if you are. But Jesus actually addresses this one. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus addresses murder. He said, and Jesus says something along these lines. He says that... that, that even if you haven't laid a hand on the brother or sister, even if you've never struck or, uh, a brother or sister, if you have called them a fool, if you've insulted them, if you've had malicious thoughts in your heart, then it is the same as murder. So while I suspect none of you have ever shed innocent blood in this place, perhaps with your hands, but maybe with your mouths, Maybe there's been some fiery words that you fired off with your mouth that hurt others when you weren't explaining things in the best possible way. Maybe there's things that you said that have ripped another person down or even the way that you've said them. Remember, those nonverbals are important too because just because you say something that sounds super sweet, but if you say it in an ugly way, it still, it still hurts. And it creates that separation. In James, not in the chapter we read today, but in James, I believe it's James 2, he talks about the tongue. He talks about the destructive nature of the tongue. He says, you know, you can bridle a horse, you can steer a ship with a rudder, but the tongue, it's untamable. It's like a, it's like a forest fire. And thanks be to God, we haven't had any yet so far this year that I know of. I was talking about that with Nancy this morning, but, but, but the forest fire, you know how destructive that is. Just a little small spark and it, and, and, it, and it takes out an entire forest. Just a little small word from your, your lips and it can destroy a person. A heart that devises wicked plans. This is referencing people who, a lack of trust in one another. It's, it's this idea of, uh, of only going to certain people and having certain conversations with certain individuals and, and not being open and transparent as the people of God. Being vulnerable as the people of God. And, and, and that's because vulnerability scares us. Because if you're vulnerable, you can be hurt. If you're vulnerable, you, 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 you take a risk. And we've been hurt. We've taken those risks. And yet... We need to do those things because we are a people together as the people of God. When we don't, when, we're, when we have these side meetings and these little uh, plotting sessions, it does no one good. It doesn't do the whole body of Christ good. And it doesn't show a trust that God will allow His will to be done. And then feet that ha make haste to run to evil. I kind of feel like this is one of those catch-all verses Feet that make haste to run to evil. This, this is a heart that is not filled with the word of God, with the love of God, with the truths of God. But this is a heart that, that, that runs after sin. This is a heart that is filled with licentiousness. A, a heart that knows the truth of God's word and knows what a sin is. But instead of accepting that, those sins as, as, as things we should not do, this person is one who says, 
It's okay, because Jesus died for me anyway. And that's licentiousness. That, that cheapens God's grace. It is true that, that God did indeed lie, lay down his life for all of our sins. But, but that does not mean, in fact, Paul says, may it not be we shouldn't run after those sins. But there are those who, they hear about God's grace and they, they instead of pursuing the love of God, the truth of God, uh, the will of God, they pursue sinful lives and even run after it. And it's interesting because it's a slippery slope, really. It may start off as a short jaunt after those sins. Every now and again, those sins pop up in our lives and we say, well, it's okay. But maybe some of you recognize how quickly that, that little jaunt in the park becomes a run. How things start to spin out of control. How sins that you think that, well, you know, right now, I, I, I kind of, I'm doing okay. And all of a sudden, we realize they're controlling us. And those sins create divisions between us and one another, and us and God. Because those sins come back to that very first that we talked about, that pride. Well, I want this because it's what makes me happy. I want that because it's what brings me pleasure. I want this because, and who cares about, and all of a sudden you see how it creates a wedge between you and others. And it leads to this last thing, dissension, discord, the abomination, the tovah. The abomination that, that, that's re referenced is, is this idea of the very opposite of what God intends for his people. This abomination is this idea that, that instead of walking together as the people of God, living together, doing ministry and mission work together, sharing the gospel together, we spend all of our time fighting with each other, infighting. This is what God does not want to see because God created us to be a people who walk together together who love one another, who care for one another. He created us people, as people to have hearts of forgiveness. And when we are filled with dissension and discord, we are letting the devil win. When we are filled with distrust in one another, we are letting the devil have the, the day. And that's what the devil wants, because you know what? The devil thinks that he's pretty powerful. The devil thinks that, that he's got this great hand and, oh yeah, he's got power, all right. But he wants us to think that he's got greater power than our God. And he does not. He does not. Our God is greater and more powerful. And his love, his forgiveness conquers all sin. All discord and all dissension. So often we live in those lives of dissension and discord. Maybe not all of these six things are things that, 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 that are part of your day-to-day -day lives, but, but are there times where, where your feet are, are running after sin instead of walking with God? Are there times where your heart's filled with pride, where, where your care for others is, is weak or even non-existent because it's all about me? Are there times where, you're, where your mouth is filled with truths that are well only halfway there? Or you don't explain everything in the best possible way? How about times where the barbs of your tongue have torn people apart in such a way that, that, that you've left them a shredded person? See, each of us, as we look at this list of six things, and we, we know that unfortunately we've seen how this has brought about discord and dissension, whether it be in our church or in our lives. We see the side effects, the pain that it causes. So God invites us to come to him. He invites us to come to him and come to his cross, come to his place of salvation. See, unlike the Wizard of Oz, and if you remember, the wizard was a fraud, right? Unlike the Wizard of Oz, uh, who hid behind a screen, our God came in to human history. Our God took on human flesh, did not hide behind a screen, did not hide in the heavens, but came down and came, became one like us in every way except without sin, so that he could give his life on the cross, so that he could give his life for you. And it wasn't ruby red slippers that would bring us home to heaven with him, but it was the ruby red blood of our Savior pouring down that tree on Calvary's cross. It was the blood of Jesus poured out for you that you might hear the words, I forgive you, spoken by your Father in heaven, who is now giving you a home 
that's even greater than we can imagine. That we might live with Him. That even though right now we know discord and dissension, He promises us a place of perfect peace. But as His people, He does give to us guidance and instruction to not let these things go on and be destructive. Because there are people outside this door who are dying without knowing Him. And so He says instead to take a different way. I want to turn with you, want you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. It's, it's almost near the back of those, pretty far back in those Bibles, those reddish ones. And Really, I actually invite you to read all of Colossians chapter 3, if not the entire book. But, but Paul's teaching the church in Colossae how to be church. And, and earlier, we're going to go later in the chapter. It's page 984 in those reddish Bibles, by the way. But, but earlier in the chapter, he goes through this whole list of things of, of what not to do. He says, fix your eyes on those things above, but don't do these things. And then he picks up, though, with this encouragement of how we should live as church. How we should be as the people of God. So we're going to pick up with Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do everything to the glory of God. Church, God has called us on an important mission. And it's not to fight with one another. It's not to tear down one another. But it's to uplift and equip one another so that we can go forth with this good news message. So that we could go forth into a world filled with hate and anger. With a world filled with discord and dissension. And be the peacemakers. And be the proclaimers of his peace. A peace that is beyond all that we can even understand. To be those who proclaim the good news of our salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have come into this world and you have taken on flesh to be like us in every way except without sin. For we know that so often our lives are filled with sin, with choices to disobey you, with choices to turn our backs on you. Lord, forgive us for those sins and, and, and focus us, our, our hearts and our minds on you. Focus us that we might love one another as you first loved us. You have said through your Apostle Paul that love covers a, a multitude of sins. Lord, help us to love one another in ways that, that make the world outside these doors say there's something different. And help us to love those in the world in a way that makes them want to know what is in our hearts. Lord, fill our hearts with your peace beyond all understanding. Fill our souls with your love and your kindness and your grace. Fill us with the hope we have in you that our sins are forgiven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.